It's with great pleasure that I welcome all of you to today's colloquium. This promises to be a very rewarding session because Mr. Bevan Alexander will be discussing his critically acclaimed and most recent work, How Hitler Could Have Won World War II. A special welcome and vote of thanks must therefore first go to Mr. Alexander, not only for his contributions to the Longwood community over these past nine years, but also for allowing us to host this very special event. And I'd also be remiss if I did not offer special thanks to the managers and the film crew of C-SPAN 2's Book TV, who are here today to film this program and to share it with a national audience. Mr. Bevan Alexander is well known to the students and faculty of our campus as a dedicated teacher, extraordinary lecturer, and brilliant historian. He has consistently displayed the ability through combining his encyclopedic knowledge of military history with the finest qualities of the historical storyteller to make history come alive for his classes. In paying him the highest compliment any student body can pay a professor, his courses are consistently in demand and are always filled to overflowing. Mr. Alexander, who holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from the Citadel and a Master of Arts degree in Journalism from, Nor from Northwestern University, has had a lifelong love of military history and professional writing. This was evident very early in his life when at the age of 23, he enlisted in the United States Army and served in the Korean War as commander of the Army's 5th Historical Detachment. In the course of becoming one of our nation's foremost combat historians, he was awarded three battle stars, and his work is now included in the official history of the United States Army in Korea. Upon returning from the war, Mr. Alexander came to Virginia and began a highly successful career in journalism. He subsequently worked as a reporter for the Richmond Times-Dispatch, an instructor of journalism at Virginia Commonwealth University, editor of Rural Virginia Magazine, and Director of Information at the University of Virginia. In 1966, he changed direction, and he was made Executive Vice President of the Virginia Hotel and Motel Association, a position he held until he retired in 1982. It was in retirement that Mr. Bevan returned full-time to his first love, the study of military history. His subsequent work in that area has earned him recognition as one of our nation's leading experts in military leadership and strategy. In addition to teaching at Longwood and being in constant demand on the lecture circuit, he has published no fewer than seven books, including the one he will discuss today. They number among them Robert E. Lee's Civil War, published in 1998, The Future of Warfare in 1995, another book in 1995, Lost Victories, the Military Genius of Stonewall Jackson, and How Great Generals Win in 1993. And finally, Korea, the first war we lost in 1986. It is testimony to his skill that each of these works was well received by both the professional historical community and the reading public. And so it is with great pleasure that I give you Mr. Alexander Bevan, who will discuss with us his newest work, how Hitler could have won World War II. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Cormier. I'm honored to be associated with this splendid institution of higher learning. Mark Twain once was having dinner with a proud and self-important man. The man drew himself up and announced, did you know that sugar is the only word in the English language spelled S-U and pronounced S-H? Mark Twain turned to the man and replied, Are you sure? <laughs> I wonder whether we are always sure about how wars are won and lost. We recognize that the world's political structure and to a large degree its social structure came about as a result of war. We understand that Americans gained their independence in one war and were forged into a single people in another. Yet as important as warfare is in resolving human conflict, 
It's not always apparent that in every war, military or political leaders make profound, solitary decisions. These decisions can have critical and lasting effects. In not a few cases, leaders make them in defiance of the advice they receive. And sometimes their decisions are so flawed that they lose the war. Let me cite two examples. Confederate General James Longstreet showed Robert E. Lee, the Southern commander, how to win the Battle of Gettysburg. Move the Confederate Army just to the south, he, he told Lee, interposing it between Washington and the Union Army. This will force the Union commander to abandon his impregnable position on Cemetery Ridge and obligate him to attack the Confederate Army directly. We will win, Longstreet said. But Lee refused, insisted on headlong, hopeless assaults against Union forces on Cemetery Ridge, and thereby lost the Civil War. Chinese Communist Premier Zhou Enlai informed President Harry Truman in October 1950 that the Chinese would intervene in the Korean War if American forces crossed the 38th parallel. Truman was so excited by the American victory in the Inchon invasion a couple weeks before that he ignored Zhou Enlai and sent American forces into North Korea. As a result, the Korean War lasted another two and a half years, cost the lives of hundreds of thousands of men, and ended along virtually the same line that American forces were standing when Zhou Enlai made his statement. For the past half century, the main thrust of study of the Second World War has portrayed Adolf Hitler as a madman, Germany as overmatched, and the victory of the Allies as inevitable. Most analyses of Hitler himself have focused on the Holocaust, his attempt to murder the Jews of Europe. This is understandable. Adolf Hitler was one of the most evil monsters the world has ever known, and his fixation on the final solution so rightfully horrified people everywhere that most writers attempted to fathom why he possessed such malignant prejudices. Yet in the end, they concluded that evil is inexplicable, that what drove Hitler to the unspeakable depths he reached can never be plumbed. The source of the hate that blackened the heart of Adolf Hitler remains as obscure and enigmatic as ever. Today, it's not easy to resurrect the intense clutch of fear that gripped the world 60 years ago. I was a boy growing up during the war, and I remember vividly the terror everyone felt that Germany might win. The horrible world Hitler wanted to create was not then some unreal bad dream, but a clear and present danger. The victory of freedom over tyranny was a near thing. As I have tried to show in my book, the outcome, outcome could just as well gone the other way. I have approached World War II by asking this question. How close did we come to losing? My starting point is a fact no one disputes, that Hitler, though most certainly mad, also possessed high intelligence, great qualities as a leader, and immense political sense. In the seven years from the time he became dictator of Germany in 1933 to midsummer 1940, Hitler made practically no mistakes. During this period, he isolated and absorbed state after state in Europe, gained the Soviet Union as a willing ally, destroyed France's military power, threw the British off the continent, and was left with only weak and vulnerable obstacles to an empire embracing most of Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. This empire not only would have been unassailable from the outside, but would have put him into the position in time to conquer the world. A number of high German officers showed Hitler time after time how 
he could achieve such an invincible position and showed him how he could do it using only a tiny fraction of Germany's military power. One of these advisors was Eric Rader, chief of the German Navy. Another was Irving Rommel, the famous Desert Fox commander in North Africa. Yet Hitler ignored the admonitions of Rader, Rommel, and others, and embarked on a course of action that guaranteed his defeat. In five years, the Thousand-Year Reich was shattered and Hitler dead. Why this happened is the subject of my book. The fundamental reason is quite astounding. Hitler decided after Germany's victory over France in 1940 that he was an infallible military genius. Having reached this conclusion, Hitler decided that he could rely entirely on his intuition. This intuition told him to downgrade the war against Britain and to turn to destruction of the Soviet Union. Hitler had hated the Soviet Union since its beginning after the Russian Revolution of 1917. And his obsession to destroy it was scarcely less intense than his obsession to, this, to destroy the Jews. In addition, Hitler wanted Lebensraum, or living space, for the German people, and intended to get it by killing or starving millions of Slavs in the Soviet Union to make room for German settlers. Yet Hitler's military commanders knew that the war in the West had been only half won, and few thought it could be finished on the plains of Russia in the East. The Soviet Union was so vast that a war there could expand into limitless space, placing potentially impossible demands on the German war machine. A war against Russia would be nothing like the war in the West, where distances were limited, populations concentrated, objectives close, and the Atlantic Ocean a finite boundary. The question occurs then, why did Hitler decide he was a military genius? He did not arrive at this conclusion on the strength of military education. Hitler had little of that. He had been a frontline soldier in the First World War, but had risen only to the rank of corporal. Hitler's reappraisal of his military qualifications came about in quite a different way. The general staff, the planning and operations branch of the German army, its intellectual core, was made up of highly professional highly trained officers. The general staff was responsible for most of the victories Germany had gained in the past 70 years. But the general staff now joined with the army commander in the Oberkommando des Heeres, the OKH, or Army High Command, was also composed of orthodox soldiers. They had studied how wars had been fought in the past and generally concluded they would be fought the same way in the future. The OKH was not unique. The high commands of both the French and British armies thought along the same conventional lines. As might have been expected, the OKH conceived a quite orthodox method to defeat France and Britain. The attack could not come anywhere across the Franco-German frontier. In the 1930s, France had constructed the Maginot Line from Switzerland to Luxembourg. The Maginot Line was a barrier of interconnected, reinforced concrete fortifications and casemated cannons that could not be overcome by direct attack. This meant the offensive had to come through Belgium. The OKH accordingly developed a plan for a massive direct strike into northern Belgium and Holland with the idea of driving the British and French armies back into France. Astonishingly, the plan did not call for the destruction of the Allied armies, only that they be forced to retreat to give Germany space to pursue an air and sea war against Britain. The plan accorded an important but not decisive job to a new kind of force, armored or panzer divisions. The panzers had been developed by a low-ranking general, Heinz Guderian. Over the objections of the general staff, Guderian had concentrated all German tanks into panzer divisions. Instead of parceling them out in penny packets, 
to infantry divisions as was and remained the practice in the British and the French armies. Guderian only achieved this victory because Adolf Hitler became enthusiastic about tanks at an exercise in 1933 and supported Guderian's idea. In the plan of the OKH, the tanks would merely assist traditional infantry divisions supported by field artillery in driving the British and the French into retreat. The Allied High Commands anticipated the German plan. It was the logical solution of every orthodox soldier. The Allies intended to block the German advance by rushing their most mobile forces, which were entrenched along the Belgian frontier, to the Dial River, about 15 miles east of the Belgian capital of Brussels. The OKH also spotted the Dial as the defensive Allied line. Therefore, both the German and Allied high commands intended to collide in a huge frontal battle along the Dial River. When Erich von, von Manstein saw the German plan, he was horrified. It paid little heed to the immense offensive power of the new Panzer divisions and would lead to stalemate and a war of attrition which Germany could not win. Manstein was chief of staff to Army Group A under Gerd von Rundstedt and he developed an entirely different plan. Concentrate the bulk of Germany's 10 Panzer divisions opposite the Ardennes, a heavily forested region of low mountains in eastern Belgium and northern Luxembourg. The roads in this region were narrow, steep, and crooked. No one expected an attack there. But Guderian assured Manstein that, that his tanks could easily negotiate the roads. A thrust through the Ardennes would come along the line of least expectation. Drive to Sedan on the Meuse River in northern France, Manstein advised. Cross the river before the French could build a defensive barrier. Then turn west and rush straight for the English Channel, 160 miles away. Since the British and French forces, meanwhile, would have streamed up to the dial, there would be virtually nothing to stop this drive. When the Panzers reached the channel, they would have cut off all the Allied troops in Belgium, forcing them to surrender. With the most mobile Allied formations eliminated, the defeat of France would be assured. But the OKH didn't like Manstein's idea. First of all, they were angry because he wanted to toss out their plan. Second, they were orthodox soldiers. Panzer divisions had been employed only once before. In 1939, against weak Polish forces armed with obsolete weapons. The French and British armies, by contrast, were modern, powerful, and extremely dangerous. To bet the entire campaign in the West on tanks and surprise was more than the OKH could stomach. Accordingly, they stonewalled. Since Manstein continued to push for his plan, they transferred him to command of an infantry corps with only a walk-on role in the upcoming campaign. They hoped Manstein would disappear and the OKH could go on with its original idea. However, Manstein used the opportunity of a luncheon Hitler held for new corps commanders to talk privately with the Fuhrer. Hitler at once saw that Manstein's idea could bring victory and the next day ordered the OKH to adopt it. The result was that Guderian broke through at Sedan in only four days, reached the English Channel a week later, and cut off all the Allied armies in Belgium. Those Allied soldiers who did not surrender were forced to evacuate by sea at Dunkirk. A month later, France capitulated, and the British were thrown onto their islands with few weapons and only 21 miles of the channel to keep them from being conquered as well. Germany had achieved the most spectacular, rapid, and overwhelming victory in the 20th century. It dominated Europe from the North Cape of Norway to the Mediterranean Sea and from Poland to the Atlantic Ocean. It was this victory that convinced Hitler that he was a military genius. He had been right 
the OKH wrong. He forgot that the idea was not his, but Eric von Manstein's, and that the implementation of that idea was not his, but Heinz Guderian's. Hitler's acceptance of Manstein's plan was the best military decision he ever made. What's bizarre is that it was practically the only great military decision Hitler made. Almost without exception, his other major decisions were wrong and contributed directly to his defeat. In other words, it was not the strength of the Allies that guaranteed the destruction of Nazi Germany. It was the disastrous decisions that Hitler himself made from mid-1940 onward after he had decided that he was a military genius. His fatal error was to attack the Soviet Union in a direct headlong assault on the main strength of the Red Army. Yet throughout the last half of 1940 and the first half of 1941, Raider and other officers pleaded with Hitler to follow another path to victory. The way was not through a frontal attack on the Soviet Union, but an indirect approach through North Africa. This route was so obvious that not only did Raider, Rommel, and other German officers see it, but so did all the British leaders. After the destruction of France's military power, Britain was left with only a single armored division to protect Egypt and the Suez Canal. Germany now had 20 armored divisions, none being used. If Germany and its ally Italy, the Axis powers, had employed only four of these panzer divisions to seize the Suez Canal, the British Royal Navy would have been compelled to withdraw from the Mediterranean Sea. This would have made supply to the British island of Malta too difficult, forcing the British to give up this base, only 60 miles south of Sicily and on the direct supply line between Italy and its colony, Libya. With the Royal Navy gone and Malta abandoned, the Mediterranean would turn into an Axis lake. This would permit the Germans to occupy French North Africa, Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia, and allow German forces to seize Dakar in Senegal on the west coast of Africa. From Dakar, submarines and aircraft could dominate the South Atlantic sea routes. With no hope of aid, Yugoslavia and Greece would be compelled to come to terms. Since Hitler was gaining Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria, as allies, Germany, Germany could achieve control of all southeastern Europe without committing a single German soldier. Once the Suez Canal was taken, the way would be open for German armored columns to overrun Palestine, Transjordan, the Arabian Peninsula, Syria, Iraq, and Iran. Britain had few troops in this region. This would give Germany unlimited supplies of the commodity it needed most, oil. As important as oil was for the conduct of modern war, the greatest advantages of German occupation of the Arab lands and Iran would be to isolate Turkey, threaten British control of India, and place German tanks and aircraft within striking distance of the Soviet oil fields in the Caucasus and along the shores of the Caspian Sea. Turkey would be forced to become an ally or grant transit rights to German forces. Britain would have to exert all its strength to protect India, and the Soviet Union would go to any lengths to preserve peace with Germany because of its perilous position. Unless the strength of the Soviet Union were added, the United States could not have projected sufficient military force across the Atlantic Ocean, even over a period of years, to reconquer Europe by amphibious invasion in the face of an untouched German war machine. Since the United States was increasingly preoccupied with the threat of Japan, it almost certainly would not have challenged Germany. Thus, Germany would have been left with a virtually invincible empire and the leisure to develop defenses and resources that in time could match the strength of the United States. Though Britain might have refused to make peace, a de facto ceasefire would have ensued. The United States would have concentrated on the defense of the Western Hemisphere and the Pacific. Even if the United States had proceeded with the development of the atomic bomb, it would have hesitated to unleash it against Germany. 
Hitler, however, rejected Raider's plan to seize French North Africa and the Suez Canal. He could not see the way to victory that Raider pointed out to him. Even in the spring of 1941, when Erwin Rommel, with a tiny German force, threw the entire British army in Egypt into headlong flight, Hitler refused the small additional strength he needed to drive onto Alexandria and Suez and force the Royal Navy out of the Mediterranean. And instead of capturing Malta, for which British from which br British warships, submarines, and aircraft constantly sank Axis supply ships en route to Libya, Hitler used his highly trained airborne troops to seize the virtually useless island of Crete. This decision cost Hitler the war. On June 22, 1941, he launched a frontal invasion of the Soviet Union. Here again, his strategy was completely flawed. The people of the Soviet Union had been oppressed for two decades by the communist autocracy. Millions had been killed, others sent to horrible prison gulags in Siberia, and most of the remainder forced to work long hours under terrible conditions to transform the Soviet Union into an industrial state. In addition, the Soviet Union was an empire ruling over a collection of subjugated peoples who were violently opposed to rule from the Kremlin. If Hitler had gone into the Soviet Union as a liberator instead of a conqueror, the vast numbers of people would have risen in rebellion and the Soviet Union would have collapsed. Instead, Hitler went into the Soviet Union, Union with precisely the opposite policy. He ordered the immediate shooting of all communist officials or commissars and all guerrillas or partisans. Since anyone could be designated a commissar or a partisan, the Germans had free reign to kill any prisoner and did so in huge numbers. The Germans also made no plans to feed the Russians they captured or overran, expecting millions to starve. Finally, directly behind the German field forces, Hitler sent in Einsatzgruppen, or extermination detachments, to hunt down and murder Jews. These acts aroused the patriotism of the Russian people and a fierce resolve to drive the Germans out of their land. Hitler's policy was totally counterproductive and contributed greatly to the defeat of the German army. Beyond these burdens, Hitler laid out impossible tasks for the army to accomplish. He ordered the army to seize Leningrad or St. Petersburg in the north, Moscow in the center, and Ukraine and the oil fields of the Caucasus in the south, and to do all this before the onset of the Russian winter. Hitler expected to conquer a million square miles of Soviet territory the first year. That's a region the size of the United States east of the Mississippi. The job he gave his soldiers was like invading the east coast of the United States and in less than six months reaching Montreal in the north, St. Louis in the center, and New Orleans in the south. This effort diverging in three directions over hundreds of miles was bound to fail. When it finally collapsed before Moscow in December 1941 in the face of snow, ice, bitter cold, and a Soviet counteroffensive, there was no hope thereafter that Germany could win the war. The enormous size of Russia, the shortage of German manpower, and the resurgence of the Red Army all converged. The moment of possible victory had passed for Germany. Hitler had gotten himself into this situation because he had three blind spots that crippled his decision making. He did not really understand the magnificent offensive weapon that Guderian had created for him in the Panzers. He could not conceive of a broad strategic plan that would lead to victory. And because he was convinced of his own military wisdom, he rejected the superb strategic plans proposed to him by Raider, Rommel, and others. Yet a negotiated peace was still possible. The campaigns in the, in the East had proved that German panzers were virtually unstoppable when they maneuvered freely across the great open spaces of Russia and Ukraine. The proper decision after the attempt to conquer the Soviet Union failed was to make strategic withdrawals to create fluid conditions
so panzers could carry out wide movements and surprise attacks. This would have given maximum effect to the still superior quality of German command staffs and fighting troops, and almost certainly would have prevented the Russians from recovering large amounts of German-occupied territory. To regain control of his country, the Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin likely would have concluded a peace with Hitler. If the Soviet Union dropped out of the war, the Western Allies might have negotiated a peace as well. But Hitler rejected anything less than total victory. He refused to allow a fluid defensive stance in the East. Instead, he insisted on continued attacks that ate up most of his remaining offensive power. At the same time, he ordered his troops to defend every inch of ground they seized. When Soviet counteroffensive struck, many of these defenders were lost. These policies, offensive too weak to succeed, and hopeless defense of every position, led, among other disasters, to the sacrifice of an entire army at Stalingrad, a quarter of a million men. The world can be grateful that Adolf Hitler deceived, him, deceived himself into thinking he was a military genius. Because of this arrogance, he disregarded advice from other commanders who could have won the war for him. Hitler himself and the criminal state he created finally died by his own false pride and belief in his own omniscience. Thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity before you. First off, my uh, grandfather f served in the uh, Korean War in the 3rd Armored Division, and uh, my question for you today is, uh, do you believe MacArthur was punished accordingly um, by, our pr by the president? Ap do you believe he was uh, punished accordingly after the Korean War for his parade in New York City? Was punished? withdrawn from Korea by the president. He, did, he this well, yeah, president. I the president. You're asking me, do I think that, that um, MacArthur was, was punished correctly by being ousted by President Truman? Is that your question? Absolutely he was. He was, he was absolutely justified by being, uh, President Truman did exactly the right thing. Uh, Mac, this, is about to, this is about World War II, by the way. <laughs> um, but um, while we're talking about the Korean War, um, uh, he tried to take over uh, control of American foreign policy himself by himself, and he tried to, in, he tried to get the Chinese to uh, into the war, and he also wanted to attack uh, China directly and use the atomic bomb. All of these would have been disasters for the United States. So he was, uh, Truman was absolutely correct in, in ousting him in April of 1951. Yes. As the magnitude of Hitler's mistakes became apparent, and it certainly should have become apparent to him after the Russian campaign, did he ever reflect upon those mistakes? Uh, I'm interested in what was his mindset? There was a period of um, decay where it was getting progressively worse. Do we have any information uh, about his... Yeah, we have an enormous amount of information about that. As a matter of fact, the, the diaries of, um, of uh, all the people who were close to Hitler uh, have detail after detail about that. that you, you made a comment with the implication that he began to degenerate after that period. I don't know that there's any proof of that. Uh, I think probably his ideas, his brain was probably just as good then as it ever had been. I think the great mistake, and when you look at the history of, uh, of what happened in World War II, the great mistake was hubris. He suddenly came up with hubris after the victory in, in 1940 with France and suddenly said, okay, I'm, I'm great. And I don't believe his brain actually uh, declined in, in, in at all during that period. But his, his decision-making was absolutely false, as I say in my talk, from that point on. And he did not listen to anyone from that point on. It's interesting. Uh, here he listened to Manstein on one little luncheon conversation. I mean, we, 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 we know about this. This is documented. But then Manstein goes to him time after time when he was an Army group commander in, 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 Europe, um, in, uh, in Russia. 
and tries to, to te tell him, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, do this. And in every single case, Hitler turned him down. Why? We, we, you have to ask the question, why did he suddenly decide, or, or certainly over a period of a year or two, decide that he no longer had to listen to Manstein? And I think the only answer you can give is that he had come to the conclusion that he had made this wonderful decision in 1940, and he must be right about everything. Yeah, um, with the uh, German, uh, my question is about German naval policy during the war. Um, it seemed to be like the German policy to send out uh, their ships, like kind of piecemeal, like with the Bismarck and the Prince Eugen. Uh, was there ever a time where the German Navy could have gone out um, and slugged it out with the uh, British uh, Navy and perhaps could have uh, defeated them with help of air cover? Uh, never. There was never a moment that they could ever have done it. The British uh, Navy was so incredibly superior uh, with surface ships. I mean, you talk about at this stage of the war, battleships, aircraft carrier did not come in as a cr critical issue for about another year. Uh, there was no possibility. The Bismarck went out almost alone. Uh, the other ships went out. They did not have this, the, the, the naval support necessary to, to uh, challenge the Royal Navy. There was never any possibility. That's why they went to the U-boats, you see. They had no, they could not put, their surface, their surface uh, weapons were, were completely inadequate. And that's one reason why, it's, so it's astonishing when you look at the history of the uh, World War II is there was no need for Germany to have a navy at all. There was no need even to have U-boats, actually. I mean, they could, they could certainly have used them at Dakar. I'm not saying they shouldn't, but, uh, but the fact is they did not have to have a navy because if they had captured the Mediterranean, it would have no longer been in naval war. Oh. Do you think that if Churchill had negotiated with Hitler at uh, Munich, uh, the outcome of the war might have been different? Instead of, instead of Chamberlain. Instead of Chamberlain. It's uh, an interesting question. It had been a lot more, more exciting, I can say that. Uh, <laughs> the speeches would have been a lot better. Uh, Neville Chamberlain came back and said, I, 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 peace in our time, which was one of the stupidest statements that had ever been stated by any, any pr <laughs> prime minister in history. No, it was not possible. Nobody could have stopped Hitler in 1938. It was absolutely impossible. As a matter of fact, Hitler was a little bit mad that he was not allowed to attack Czechoslovakia. He wanted to attack Czechoslovakia. He wanted to show the world how powerful he was. Now, he was wrong at that stage because he'd had a tough time. But his actual mindset in 1938 at Munich was to attack Czechoslovakia. So, no, it would not have changed anything. Had the plot to assassinate Hitler in the Wolf's Lair succeeded, 44, what kind of terms do you think the Allies might have been willing to extend the Germans? That's a question I don't think we'll ever answer thoroughly. You know, you start from the premise, which I'm sure you're all aware of, that at uh, Casablanca, uh, uh, Roosevelt and uh, Churchill decided on the doctrine of unconditional surrender. Therefore, we were saddled with the concept of unconditional surrender of the German army. Now, most people think that this led the Germans onward, onward, onward and into um, to more and more uh, greater defense, and that's not really true. There's no, it's no, it's no evidence of that whatsoever. And a lot of people do not know the real reason why Roosevelt and, and Chur Churchill did that. They did it only to tell Joseph Stalin that, that the Western Allies were not going to have a separate peace. This was to keep the Soviet Union in the war. That was the only reason for unconditional surrender in the final analysis. Now, so you come down to, say, 1944, and a man is killed. Now, you're assuming that? Is that your charge? All right, there was a large group of uh, people thinking at that stage that the German army would surrender to the Allies in the West, and they would, then they would join up and be great big buddies and go off and attack the communists in the East. This is so totally absurd that uh, you sometimes just laugh at it, but th there was a lot of thought in this direction, and the Germans actually, a, a good number of them, actually thought that this might come about. But I don't believe there was ever any possibility. Uh, there, what you maybe know, I'm sure some of, some of you do know, that there was the, an effort by Rommel and some of the other people that in 1940, after the Normandy invasion, to, to have a, a ceasefire in the West. In other words, give in on the West stop fighting the uh, Western Allies, 
and would continue to fight in the East. I don't believe this would have changed anything. And the, 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 the history of the time and the documentation of the time says that Eisenhower was absolutely in, opposed to that, that possibility because he would see this as a way to divide and conquer and that was, the, uh, that was what they were absolutely determined not to do. So I don't think it would have made any difference. I really don't. Yes. Uh, Mr. Alexander, how much effect did ULTRA have on divining German intentions? ULTRA, as you probably all know, was the breaking of the Enigma uh, encoding machine that the uh, Germans developed actually in 1929 and the Germans were so proud of this machine that, that they assumed that it could never be broken. Uh, this is one thing that astonishes me in, in looking at Germany. Here was a very outstanding nation, a very advanced nation that thought, well, we came up with this code and nobody can break this code. It had been, it was actually, the machine was stolen or somehow or another acquired by Poles in 1939. And, uh, Bletchley, in, in Bletchley in uh, England, uh, in an in a old manor house, a, a group of very intelligent mathematicians began breaking the code early, early in the war. Uh, they never broke the Gestapo code. They broke the Luftwaffe, that's the Air Force, the German Air Force code very quickly. That's why they were successful in the, in the war in Britain, uh, the, war, the air war in Britain in 1940, because they broke the code. Um, the question in my mind is whether it, it definitely helped the Allies to find out where things were going in advance. But by the time it became truly useful, the, the Allies in any particular theater where they were were so powerful, so overwhelmingly powerful in terms of, of strength to the German forces that in most cases it did not make a decisive difference. So I don't think we can say that it made a decisive difference. There's a famous case which uh, always strikes me when you start relying too much on, on, on intelligence that um, the, the famous Battle of Kasserine Pass in 1943 in Tunisia, the uh, Allies through ULTRA had decided that uh, the, the attack of the Germans was going to be at a pass about 40 miles north of where it actually took place. And that's why Rommel, who, who led the Kasserine attack, was able to get, and nearly, if he had gotten, if he hadn't had such bad support from other Germans, he could very well have, have, have uh, surrounded and wiped out a large portion of the, of the Allied army in Tunisia. So there was a mistake in the other direction. But it, it was very important, but it was not crucial. Yes, sir. Following uh, the defeat at Stalingrad in early 1943, was there something that Hitler could have done to create a stalemate, if not victory, on the Eastern Front? Any type of stra uh, strategic change or tactical change? Or was defeat inevitable after the defeat at Stalingrad? No, it was not inevitable. That's a good question. It was not inevitable. In fact, Manstein, the same guy who, in, who came up with the idea to beat, to beat France, came to, to Hitler immediately after Stalingrad and proposed a dramatic strategic plan. He said that at that stage, if to reconstruct it a bit for you, the, the German Sixth Army, which was down to, by this stage, about 98,000 men, but had already had started 250,000, was surrounded and was going to die at Stalingrad. No way that could have been saved. But the problem was that there was an army group in the Caucasus, several hundred miles into the Caucasus. Uh, Manstein's army group, which had been saddled with the job of trying to save Stalingrad, and Hitler wouldn't let him, was another small army group that was in that same region. And the Soviets were quite aware that all they had to do to cut off both of those armies, army groups, would be to drive straight down to Rostov on the Sea of Azov, which is, was only about 150 or 200 miles away. And if they reached, this, if they reached Rostov, these two army groups in the Caucasus would be would be cut off and it would be in a huge Stalingrad. I mean, when you're talking about Stalingrad, this would have been a million or more men would have been lost. And, and this was the great danger that the Germans faced after Stalingrad. Manstein goes to Hitler and says, Let's, we, we can't keep the Caucasus anyway. We can't keep this region anyway. Let's withdraw uh, in a very measured way to the west 
And when we get about to the Dnieper River, which was several hundred miles west, by this time, the, the Soviets will absolutely insist upon attacking after us. This will leave an enormous area to the west that they have advanced into. We will assemble an army at Kharkov, which is to the northwest, and when they do that, we'll drive straight through and cut off the entire force, and this would change the entire strategic balance in the, in the east, and it would have happened. It could have happened. But Hitler refused to do that, and what I said in my talk, he could not accept anyone moving from a place they had actually conquered or, 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 or captured. And for this reason, no movements like this were possible for Hitler. He could never accept it. He, he learned that in World War I, you see, during that stalemate on the Western Front where everybody moved in inches. That's how he learned about warfare. And therefore, he never learned beyond that. I'm a, thank you. I'm a devotee of... Um, propaganda, I guess. Charlie Chaplin, just watched The Great Dictator, and you did allude in your opening remarks to the effects of the, uh, the Third Reich taking over the world. Could you talk a little bit about more about the effect in the United States of the threat of Hitler and the threat felt in the States and some of the, uh, perhaps the way Charlie Chaplin's film, The Great Dictator, might have eased some of the concerns or not sure? Uh, that's an interesting question. Of course, the great dictator came out when, in 1938? Yeah, 1938. And it, and it turned Hitler into a buffoon, as I'm sure you recall. Uh, Hitler was not a buffoon. Now, he did climb, uh, he did climb curtains, it turns out. Uh, this is true. Uh, he, he, there's some actual documentation of him climbing curtains. And, uh, and he did uh, froth at the mouth, but I frothed at the mouth in front of my students. So uh, that's, that's not necessarily an indication of madness, although it might be. <laughs> um, but I, I, think it, it, I think the mistake we made at that period was to treat him as a buffoon instead of the huge danger that he was. I think that was a great, the great mistake we made. But I, I would like to add to that something that I recall, as I say, I was a boy at the time. And I remember distinctly what was actually taking place in 1940 after France fell. And I know exactly what people were thinking. And the, the, the withdrawal behind our two oceans was the primary thought that we had in 1940 in the United States. We wanted to back off the, the so-called isolationist movement. We wanted to back off and defend our, our island. You see, one people don't quite understand it. Americans actually think of themselves as living on an island. We actually think of ourselves as, a, as, a, as an island nation. And if you think about it, that's the Monroe Doctrine's whole concept. We're protecting our, our hemisphere, our big island, from all those invaders. And that's what Washington was talking about, the Monroe Doctrine. All of that's based around the fact that we have this island. And only after World War II did we ever uh, break ourselves out of this isolationist attitude and become world, world power. So that with the World War II was the actual catalyst that did that. Yes, on the other side of the room we have several questions. Hi. It's often said that Churchill considered the Italian peninsula the soft underbelly of Europe. Did any of Hitler's high command uh, give him any suggestions or plans to really reinforce Italy and uh, I guess prevent the eventual takeover of Europe by the Allies? Thanks. Understand you correct your question. You mean was the idea of going into Italy a viable argument for the Allies as, as a strategic move? Uh, was the reinforce? Were there any suggestions for the reinforcement of Axis powers in Italy and to prevent the taking of Italy by Patton and the Allies? Um, it was not any great danger. Uh, Italy. Uh, any of you people who have been to Italy know that it consists of one valley and one mountain after another. And uh, therefore, uh, there is not a very, it's not a very nice place to fight a war. And therefore, the danger of, um, of a, uh, the possibility of a victory through Italy was always ephemeral. It was always, uh, it was always uh, impossible. Now, could we have moved into the... Um, through the Tyrol, uh, or maybe through, uh, uh, through Trieste, or some region like that, <clears throat> at the top of the, uh, uh, the Adriatic Sea? I don't think so, because you still had the um, Alps there, and the Alps are incredibly difficult mountains. Could you have gone through the Balkans? Well, the Balkans were at the tail end of uh, Europe with terrible roads, very few railroads, 
and very, very far from the heart of Germany. So I don't believe there was a possibility in that direction any, either. Uh, the only possible other direction you could have gone would be into southern France, and what, what would, what's the advantage of that? You would, have been, you would have been with the Alps to your east, you would have still had to go all the way through France. Uh, it would have been better to, if you're going to do that, go on in Normandy, which is what they decided to do. So no, there was never, there was never any viable argument to go through the, the soft underbelly of the Axis, as Churchill called the Mediterranean. There was never any way to win victory there. He, we might have gotten to a stalemate with Germany, but Germany, uh, Germany was the one who, that could have achieved the stalemate. We were trying for victory. Hi. Uh, my quick question is, uh, why did Hitler order his uh, forces to seize uh, fighting at uh, Dunkirk in uh, 1940? Well, if you can answer that question, you're going to get a, you have a bestseller, I can tell you. That, this is one of the great imponderables of the world, and nobody knows why. Uh, to recapitulate it for you for just a second, uh, Guderian's panzers were with, they were at Gravelin, which is what, 10 miles from Dunkirk, while the British and the French armies were 35 or 40 miles to the east. In other words, the panzers were already at Dunkirk when <coughs> Hitler stopped them. <coughs> he stopped them along the, <coughs> the Bassi Canal, which was uh, 10 or 8 or 10 or 12 miles south of, of Dunkirk. And the question is why? Um, Hitler was a very uh, frightened man at this stage. Uh, he was more and more, he got more and more frightened every step that the success of the Germans got more and more obvious. That uh, he, he could not believe it was going to happen, and it was happening so fast, Guderian was going so fast and winning so incre incredibly quickly that he began to try to put brakes on the, uh, on the German army. And actually did. Uh, but, finally, and, but finally, at the stage at Dunkirk, he, um, he put an order out that they stop. And... There are two reasons that have been advanced for this. One of them is, is somewhat logical. And that is that the Panzers at this stage, the, the battle had virtually been won anyway. The Panzers needed to, to re, replenish themselves and, and refurbish and turn around to, to conquer France to the south. And so they had, they had to actually turn direction and move back. And that, that was necessary. It had to be done. The, the other thing was that... Uh, Hermann Goering, who was ch uh, chief of the Luftwaffe, the Air Force, told Hitler that his aircraft could stop the British from evacuating, French and British, and French as well, from evacuating from, from Dunkirk. Now, he didn't do it, and we can get on that in just a second, but the other, other argument that's been raised, which actually is maybe closer to the truth, is that Hitler did not want to fight Britain. That's not been very, I didn't make that plain in this talk today, but. He wanted the British as allies. He wanted the British to keep their empire. And he wanted simply to have complete control on the, on the continent of, of Europe. And he would let the British uh, have their empire and they'd be great buddies and allies forever. Well, of course, Britain couldn't remain an independent country if, it was, um, if, if, if uh, Europe was under the control of Nazi Germany. And, and the British absolutely refused that. But he didn't, Hitler did not really believe that they wouldn't see reason and uh, therefore come to become allies of Germany. So the argument has been raised that he deliberately stopped the German panzers from, from capturing Dunkirk in order for the British to not lose 300 or 250,000 men and uh, get back and therefore they'd be so grateful. Well, of course, it had the opposite effect. It became the miracle of Dunkirk that you probably know about where the British took little yachts, civilian people, ordinary Ordinary British people went out and took those soldiers and, and took them back to, uh, to, to England in tiny little boats. And uh, that became the miracle of Dunkirk and actually increased the resolve of the British to continue the war. Yes. Um, yes, I was wondering about the uh, status of the German nuclear or atomic program and why it was, why it was stopped, uh, if that could have proved to be a valuable tool in their arsenal, you know, et cetera. Well, the Germans stopped before it got very far. They did, they did some work with uh, heavy water, and you probably know about that. Pinamunda was some, some tests going on there. The British knew about it and, and, and made a preemptive strike on that place, I think, in 1942. 
But the Germans never did proceed in the uh, development of the atomic bomb. So it was never any possibility during the time frame of the Second World War that the Germans could have ever developed the atomic bomb. Now, the question is, would, would they have afterwards? Absolutely they would. But that, at the stage of the war, there was never any possibility of it. They, after all, they kicked out all their, a large number of their great uh, nuclear people, uh, scientists, were, were Jews. And they kicked all those people out. Al Albert Einstein, of course, was not a, was not a nuclear uh, physicist, but uh, he, was, he was the kind of person that they kicked out of Germany because he was Jewish. So he, he shot himself in the foot in that direction as well. We'll take just two more questions. Dr. Barber, and then we'll take the gentleman first. My question was, if D-Day had failed, would Hitler still have lost the war? You gave me two big ifs there. Um, if it had failed, yeah, he'd have lost the war. He couldn't have won anyway at that stage. Now, we might have taken a longer time to do it, and we might have begun to think perhaps of some negotiated arrangement. But Hitler, even to the very last, could not conceive of, um, of a negotiated peace. And if you think about it, you can understand that for a second. He knew that he was murdering Jews all over Europe. The rest of the world didn't really know that. I mean, there, were, there was information about it, but the world as a whole did not really know that he, the monstrous things he was doing in Europe. And he knew that as soon as anybody got to, to begin to look around Europe, they were going to kill him. And he knew that there was no way he could survive the war in any kind of a negotiated arrangement whatsoever. So long before this stage, he knew that he had either to win the war or die. And there were ne numerous things at the last stage. For example, in June of 1944, about the time that the Allies invaded uh, uh, in Normandy, the Russians got to, the, um, to, the, um, uh, to Warsaw in Poland. And at that stage, it was no possibility from that point on of, of a German victory. It was quite obvious. They had just lost a million men in the retreat to Warsaw, or to that region the Vistula River, the line of the Vistula River. And a number of the German officers said to him, we've got to stop. And he, he, he refused because he knew at that stage there was no possibility of stopping. He had to go on to victory. So the last, you can say really the last uh, seven or eight months of the war was just to keep Hitler alive. That's what you can say the last seven months of the war were, to keep him alive. Hitler wasn't the only one to have made mistakes in the beginning of the Second World War. What was it about the Allies that caused them to not recognize what Hitler was about early on? After all, he had written his plan for invading Czechoslovakia and Austria in Mein Kampf, which was written years before. Um, why were they not aware of his plans? Well, I don't know how to answer that question. Uh, why do... Uh, why does anyone not, ex not take the evidence in front of them? I teach a course, and some of you students are here, and you've heard me already say in my classes that one of the astonishing things about warfare is that in most wars, you find exactly that in front of you, that, that the evidence is right smack in front of your face, and, and if you use your, your uh, noggin, you can see that, that, that you can win or lose on the strength of what's right in front of you. And so the answer to your question is people do that. People just simply do not believe in... Um, in the, in the evidence in front of their faces. Uh, you probably recall uh, there was documentation, uh, uh, speeches, uh, uh, articles throughout that entire period saying, well, Hitler really is a reasonable man. And, and I go back to what I said about Chamberlain. He comes away from having just been completely bamboozled by Adolf Hitler at, at, at Munich and said, we're going to have peace in our time. Here was a chief of the, uh, of the British government saying, believing this, which was an absolute lie, and he, he should have known it. Everybody else knew it. I mean, in theory, they knew it. This is what I'm afraid is, is uh, the human condition. We want to believe things that uh, we want to believe. And if it's not a war, it's better than a war. So we'll say, okay, let's, let's hope for it not being a war. And I think that's what brought on World War I, uh, excuse me, World War II, was just that simple hope. And there was never a hope, really, there was never hope from the moment Hitler became dictator of Germany in 1933. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate very much the opportunity to be in front. But, but, 
I know you probably don't want to hear anything more I have to say forever, but uh, there are copies of my talk if you'd like to have them at the end. I'd be happy to have them. Thank you. Also, I just want to say, Mr. Alexander, there are many of us, or at least some of the people in this room, who lived through World War II. I think many of us have struggled all of our lives to try to understand this war. And what I can tell you about today is that I understand it a bit better. And I thank you so much for this. It was wonderful. Thank you. It's with great pleasure that I welcome all of you to today's colloquium. This promises to be a very rewarding session because Mr. Bevan Alexander will be discussing his critically acclaimed and most recent work, How Hitler Could Have Won World War II. A special welcome and vote of thanks must therefore first go to Mr. Alexander, not only for his contributions to the Longwood community over these past nine years, but also for allowing us to host this very special event. And I'd also be remiss if I did not offer special thanks to the managers and the film crew of C-SPAN 2's Book TV, who are here today to film this program and to share it with a national audience. Mr. Bevan Alexander is well known to the students and faculty of our campus as a dedicated teacher, extraordinary lecturer, and brilliant historian. He has consistently displayed the ability through combining his encyclopedic knowledge of military history with the finest qualities of the historical storyteller to make history come alive for his classes. In paying him the highest compliment any student body can pay a professor, his courses are consistently in demand and are always filled to overflowing. Mr. Alexander, who holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from the Citadel and a Master of Arts degree in Journalism from, Nor from Northwestern University, has had a lifelong love of military history and professional writing. This was evident very early in his life when at the age of 23, he enlisted in the United States Army and served in the Korean War as commander of the Army's 5th Historical Detachment. In the course of becoming one of our nation's foremost combat historians, he was awarded three battle stars, and his work is now included in the official history of the United States Army in Korea. Upon returning from the war, Mr. Alexander came to Virginia and began a highly successful career in journalism. He subsequently worked as a reporter for the Richmond Times-Dispatch, an instructor of journalism at Virginia Commonwealth University, editor of Rural Virginia Magazine, and Director of Information at the University of Virginia. In 1966, he changed direction, and he was made Executive Vice President of the Virginia Hotel and Motel Association, a position he held until he retired in 1982. It was in retirement that Mr. Bevan returned full-time to his first love, the study of military history. His subsequent work in that area has earned him recognition as one of our nation's leading experts in military leadership and strategy. In addition to teaching at Longwood and being in constant demand on the lecture circuit, he has published no fewer than seven books, including the one he will discuss today. They number among them Robert E. Lee's Civil War, published in 1998, The Future of Warfare in 1995, another book in 1995, Lost Victories, the Military Genius of Stonewall Jackson, and How Great Generals Win in 1993. And finally, Korea, the first war we lost in 1986. It is testimony to his skill that each of these works was well received by both the professional historical community and the reading public. And so it is with great pleasure that I give you Mr. Alexander Bevan, who will discuss with us his newest work, how Hitler could have won World War II. To make room for German settlers. Yet Hitler's military commanders knew that the war in the West had been only half won. And few thought it could be finished on the plains of Russia in the East. The Soviet Union was so vast that a war there could expand into limitless space placing potentially impossible demands on the German war machine. A war against Russia would be nothing like the war in the West, 
where distances were limited, populations concentrated, objectives close, and the Atlantic Ocean a finite boundary. The question occurs then, why did Hitler decide he was a military genius? He did not arrive at this conclusion on the strength of military education. Hitler had little of that. He had been a frontline soldier in the First World War, but had risen only to the rank of corporal. Hitler's reappraisal of his military qualifications came about in quite a different way. The general staff, the planning and operations branch of the German army, its intellectual core, was made up of highly professional, highly trained officers. The general staff was responsible for most of the victories Germany had gained in the past 70 years. But the general staff, now joined with the army commander in the Oberkommando des Heeres, the OKH, or Army High Command, was also composed of orthodox soldiers. They had studied how wars had been fought in the past, and generally concluded they would be fought the same way in the future. The OKH was not unique. The high commands of both the French and British armies thought along the same conventional lines. As might have been expected, the OKH conceived a quite orthodox method to defeat France and Britain. The attack could not come anywhere across the Franco-German frontier. In the 1930s, France had constructed the Maginot Line from Switzerland to Luxembourg. The Maginot Line was a barrier of interconnected, reinforced con concrete fortifications and casemated cannons that could not be overcome by direct attack. This meant the offensive had to come through Belgium. The OKH accordingly developed a plan for a massive direct strike into northern Belgium and Holland with the idea of driving the British and French armies back into France. Astonishingly, the plan did not call for the destruction of the Allied armies, only that they be forced to retreat to give Germany space to pursue an air and sea war against Britain. The plan accorded an important but not decisive job to a new kind of force, armored or panzer division. The Panzers had been developed by a low-ranking general, Heinz Guderian. Over the objections of the general staff, Guderian had concentrated all German tanks into Panzer divisions. Instead of parceling them out in penny packets to infantry divisions, as was and remained the practice in the British and the French armies. Guderian only achieved this victory because Adolf Hitler became enthusiastic about tanks at an exercise in 1933 and supported Guderian's idea. In the plan of the OKH, the tanks would merely assist traditional infantry divisions supported by field artillery in driving the British and the French into retreat. The Allied High Commands anticipated the German plan. It was the logical solution of every orthodox soldier. The Allies intended to block the German advance by rushing their most mobile forces, which were entrenched along the Belgian frontier, to the Dial River, about 15 miles east of the Belgian capital of Brussels. The OKH also spotted the Dial as the defensive Allied line. Therefore, both the German and Allied high commands intended to collide in a huge frontal battle along the Dial River. When Erich von, von Man Manstein saw the German plan, he was horrified. It paid little heed to the immense offensive power of the new Panzer divisions and would lead to stalemate and a war of attrition which Germany could not win. Manstein was chief of staff to Army Group A under H uh, Gerd von Rundstedt, and he developed an entirely different plan. Concentrate the bulk of Germany's 10 Panzer divisions opposite the Ardennes, a heavily forested region of low mountains in eastern Belgium and northern Luxembourg. The roads in this region were narrow, steep, and crooked. No one expected an attack there. But Guderian assured Manstein that 
that his tanks could easily negotiate the roads. A thrust through the Ardennes would come along the line of least expectation. Drive to Sedan on the Meuse River in northern France, Manstein advised. Cross the river before the French could build a defensive barrier, then turn west and rush straight for the English Channel, 160 miles away. Since the British and French forces, meanwhile, would have streamed up to the dial, there would be virtually nothing to stop this drive. When the Panzers reached the Channel, they would have cut off all the Allied troops in Belgium, forcing them to surrender. With the most mobile Allied formations eliminated, the defeat of France would be assured. But the OKH didn't like Manstein's idea. First of all, they were angry because he wanted to toss out their plan. Second, they were orthodox soldiers. Panzer divisions had been employed only once before, in 1939, against weak Polish forces armed with obsolete weapons. The French and British armies, by contrast, were modern, powerful, and extremely dangerous. To bet the entire campaign in the West on tanks and surprise was more than the OKH could stomach. Accordingly, they stonewalled. Since Manstein continued to push for his plan, they transferred him to command of an infantry corps with only a walk-on role in the upcoming campaign. They hoped Manstein would disappear and the OKH could go on with its original idea. However, Manstein used the opportunity of a luncheon Hitler held for new corps commanders to talk privately with the Fuhrer. Hitler at once saw that Manstein's idea could bring victory, and the next day ordered the OKH to adopt it. The result was that Guderian broke through at Sedan in only four days, reached the English Channel a week later, fathom why he possessed such malignant prejudices. Yet in the end, they concluded that evil is inexplicable, that what drove Hitler to the unspeakable depths he reached can never be plumbed. The source of the hate that blackened the heart of Adolf Hitler remains as obscure and enigmatic as ever. Today, it's not easy to resurrect the intense clutch of fear that gripped the world 60 years ago. I was a boy growing up during the war, and I remember vividly the terror everyone felt that Germany might win. The horrible world Hitler wanted to create was not then some unreal bad dream, but a clear and present danger. The victory of freedom over tyranny was a near thing. As I have tried to show in my book, the outcome, outcome could just as well gone the other way. I have approached World War II by asking this question. How close did we come to losing? My starting point is a fact no one disputes, that Hitler, though most certainly mad, also possessed high intelligence, great qualities as a leader, and immense political sense. In the seven years from the time he became dictator of Germany in 1933 to midsummer 1940, Hitler made practically no mistakes. During this period, he isolated and absorbed state after state in Europe, gained the Soviet Union as a willing ally, destroyed France's military power, threw the British off the continent, and was left with only weak and vulnerable obstacles to an empire embracing most of Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. This empire not only would have been unassailable from the outside, but would have put him into the position in time to conquer the world. A number of high German officers showed Hitler time after time how he could achieve such an invincible position and showed him how he could do it using only a tiny fraction of Germany's military power. One of these advisors was Erich Rader, chief of the German Navy. Another was Irving Rommel, the famous Desert Fox commander in North Africa. Yet Hitler ignored the admonitions of Raider, Rommel, and others, and embarked on a course of action 
that guaranteed his defeat. In five years, the Thousand-Year Reich was shattered and Hitler dead. Why this happened is the subject of my book. The fundamental reason is quite astounding. Hitler decided after Germany's victory over France in 1940 that he was an infallible military genius. Having reached this conclusion, Hitler decided that he could rely entirely on his intuition. This intuition told him to downgrade the war against Britain and to turn to destruction of the Soviet Union. Hitler had hated the Soviet Union since its beginning after the Russian Revolution of 1917. And his obsession to destroy it was scarcely less intense than his obsession to, this, to destroy the Jews. In addition, Hitler wanted Lebensraum, or living space, for the German people, and intended to get it by killing or starving millions of Slavs in the Soviet Union. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cormier. I'm honored to be associated with this splendid institution of higher learning. Mark Twain once was having dinner with a proud and self-important man. The man drew himself up and announced, did you know that sugar is the only word in the English language spelled S-U and pronounced S-H? Mark Twain turned to the man and replied, are you sure? I wonder whether we are always sure about how wars are won and lost. We recognize that the world's political structure, and to a large degree, its social structure, came about as a result of war. We understand that Americans gained their independence in one war and were forged into a single people in another. Yet as important as warfare is, in resolving human conflict. It's not always apparent that in every war, military or political leaders make profound, solitary decisions. These decisions can have critical and lasting effects. In not a few cases, leaders make them in defiance of the advice they receive. And sometimes their decisions are so flawed that they lose the war. Let me cite two examples. Confederate General James Longstreet showed Robert E. Lee, the Southern commander, how to win the Battle of Gettysburg. Move the Confederate Army just to the south, he, he told Lee, interposing it between Washington and the Union Army. This will force the Union commander to abandon his impregnable position on Cemetery Ridge and obligate him to attack the Confederate Army directly. We will win, Longstreet said. But Lee refused, insisted on headlong, hopeless assaults against Union forces on Cemetery Ridge, and thereby lost the Civil War. Chinese Communist Premier Zhou Enlai informed President Harry Truman in October 1950 that the Chinese would intervene in the Korean War if American forces crossed the 38th parallel. Truman was so excited uh, by the American victory in the Inchon invasion a couple weeks before that he ignored Zhou Enlai and sent American forces into North Korea. As a result, the Korean War lasted another two and a half years, cost the lives of hundreds of thousands of men, and ended along virtually the same line that American forces were standing when Zhou Enlai made his statement. For the past half century, the main thrust of study of the Second World War has portrayed Adolf Hitler as a madman, Germany as overmatched, and the victory of the Allies as inevitable. Most analyses of Hitler himself have focused on the Holocaust, his attempt to murder the Jews of Europe. This is understandable. Adolf Hitler was one of the most evil monsters the world has ever known. And his fixation on the final solution so rightfully horrified people everywhere that most writers attempted 